And uh, we're going to worship God, and we're going to praise Him together. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's praise Him. So that we don't have to fret. Amen. He paid the debt so that we don't have to worry. We can stay stand fast on the victory in Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to stay in the victory. Stay right there with Jesus. 
Don't get in front of him, but either stay right with him or right behind him. Amen? Let's stay with him. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan has got to flee. Tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. We have the victory in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Satan, Satan will have to today. Oh yeah, tell me who can. Stand before us when we call on that great name, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory. In the name, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. We've got the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. Tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory. Come on. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. We've already won, no. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. Oh, tell me who can. Stand before us when we call on that great name. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's thank Him for the victory. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, for the victory in Your name. Thank you, God, for the victory that your word declares, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for the victory, hallelujah, that we have in your name, that we have as we become sons and daughters of the most high, most awesome king that ever was. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. There's nothing that could stand against His name. The Bible says every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that great name. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe it. Do you believe that? Do you believe that what the Word has says is true? I believe that Jesus Christ is the lead. He is the chief cornerstone. Amen? He is the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated at this time. We're going to give you an opportunity to give um, at this time. I'm going to ask Brother Neil Paget and Brother Hux to help me out real quick.
Amen. Let's all stand one more time again together as you bring that now to the Lord. Sorry, if you haven't brought that, you can. And uh, we are excited to be a part of that kingdom that will not fail. Excited to be a part. Now, not people aren't going to fail, but the kingdom of God will never fail. The kingdom of God will prevail. Amen. Jesus will prevail. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to receive our speaker tonight, Brother Andre Messner, has prepared a word for us today. Amen. Brother, preach to us, please. Well, praise God. Praise, I love those songs, those old hymnals, those old music that just gets right to the heart of it, victory in Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Well, before I get started too much, I want a quick announcement. There's going to be at the Krug Park tomorrow at the children's play area, not the castle, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. There's going to be a children's play time, fellowship time with adults, you know, just kind of some fellowship. So I just want to let them know because once we get preaching, once we get going, I'll forget, I'll forget that. Amen? So sorry, we should have given that to you before. Sorry. Well, praise God. Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Praise God. You know, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for his presence. I'm so thankful. I don't know what it is, but in my own prayer devotion, I feel God, and I feel him strong, and I'm so thankful for that. But there's something about the house of God. Come in here and being with the other like-minded saints who are seeking after God, and you just walk by someone as you're praying. You're like, "Woo! I feel the spirit on that person. Man, I love it. I love it. It encourages me. I love hearing people shout. I love hearing people just absolutely let go and get into the arms of God. Don't you? Are you thankful for his grace? Are you thankful for his rest? You know, I'm so thankful that he sets us free, that he delivers us from the enemy time and time again. Well, tonight, tonight's message is coming straight out of Judges 531. It's a little bit different tonight. Because I know I'm known for lots of scripture, but tonight I'm just going to mention the scripture. I'm going to hope you know where they are in the Bible. Because I think I take too much time referencing things you guys already know where it's at. So tonight I'm going to try to preach to you a little bit. And the good Lord has given me plenty of time, so I'm not going to worry about it. Amen? Okay, I got half of you. So praise God. All right, Judges 531. Are we not sitting? There we go. So let all thy enemies perish, O Lord. But let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. Now think about that. I know there's more, but that's the key part right there. Think, you know, why don't you say it with me? So let all thy enemies perish, O Lord. Now just that part. Now think about this. Think about this. Let all thy enemies perish. In Judges, I believe this is Deborah saying, God, let all thy enemies perish. We can ask God, let all thy enemies perish. Think about the significance of that. Because who is God's enemy? Think about it real carefully. Who is God's enemy? That's an interesting question. I'm going to try to help reveal here tonight. Who is God's enemy? But I got to tell you this. If you are a child of God, then the enemy of God is also your enemy. Is that right? The enemy of my God is the enemy of me because I live for him. Because as far as I read the scripture, there's only two ways to go. There's the world and there's God. And God said, you're either for me or you're against me. 
So let's pray that God shares some interesting insights and helps us in that battle. In Jesus' name, Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would loosen ministering spirits and guardian angels in the house tonight. That, Lord, that you would rebuke and bind up and cast out every hard heart, every veil in the eyes, every evil spirit, devil, and demon that would hinder people from receiving your word. Lord Jesus, I pray that people would listen and observe and, and absolutely intake and receive the faith that you have for them tonight. That, Lord, that they would learn how to better destroy the enemy with your help, Lord Jesus. I pray that your words would flow into their belly as running, washing waters, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would absolutely wash us with your word, make us anew, and help us, Lord Jesus to be better for it. Let your word reign in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Well, it's good news. I'm already past my first page. <laughs> hey, I didn't get any amens. Right on. Because I've struggled in the past getting through half of my notes. But it's pretty good. You know, we all know that story, Egypt, with Moses, right? We all know the story how Egypt had Israel in bondage. Now, God sent them down there to strengthen them and grow them, and they became a mighty force, millions and millions of people. But we know how Egypt feared them and turned on them, and that they were slaves. Now, yeah, they had food. Yeah, they had shelter. They had water. They weren't expected to go fight in any wars, but they were still slaves. They were tormented, and their cries went up to the Lord, and the Lord heard them, and he kept the promise he gave Abraham. And so he made a way, and he, by the, his sheer mercy, he brought them out of Egypt. I'm not going to go through that whole story. That's not the point of my message tonight. But my point is this, that as he took them through the Red Sea, as the enemy came to kill them and take them back, the waters came down and crushed them, and he destroyed the enemies of Israel. He destroyed his enemies. Now, what's interesting about this story that I love so much, is that God did so much for Israel. Can you imagine seeing the hail coming down, the swarms of locusts, how there was light on the camp of Israel, but it's all darkness on Egypt? That the Israel cattle were spared, but the Egyptian cattle were killed. That there was boils and sores all over Egypt, but not on Israel. Can you imagine seeing that? And then walking through the Red Sea, and you're just looking up at walls of water, and you're walking across on dry land. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. But then can you understand the frustration that God had when only there are a few days in their journey, and they're already starting to whine. They're already starting to complain. They're already starting to murmur. They went a few days' journey without water, few days journey without food. You don't hear Moses complaining because Moses understood. He said, look, he just carried me out. I'm free. I am bought with a price. He just saved me. Whatever God does to me in his sight is right. He had the right attitude. In fact, the only thing I can see Moses really complaining about is, God, you gave me these people. <laughs> Stiff neck, rebellious people, right? But what did the people do? They murmured and complained. And if you really look at that, you'll see all the murmuring, all the complaining. When God just did so much for them, brought death, brought, brought absolute pain. Because God brought judgment on that mur murmuring. And you have to think about it. How does this relate to us? How does this relate to us in our walk with God? Well, you know, I've already seen I haven't been in this long. But I'm so grateful I'm here. I'm so grateful I'm here. Because God is a merciful God. And I pray that I never take his mercy for granted. Never take his grace for granted. But I know this, that when you go through and God calls you and you repent and you get washed in the baptismal waters and you get filled with the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues and he sets you free from the enemy. How dare we then look back to Egypt and say, well, he set me free, but man, I still like looking like them. I still want to act like Egypt. I still want to dress like Egypt. Oh, I'm set free. I've been baptized to follow Acts 2.38. But now, oh, the, the word wants me to wear my hair how? The word wants me to dress in what way? Oh, man. But that's different than everybody else. 
Well, as far as I read the scripture, we're to come out from among them and be ye separate. Amen? But yet we're murmuring in our own ways. I know this is Wednesday night, and most people here don't have a problem with that. Don't worry, I'll get to you. But <laughs> I'm just getting started. But what I'm talking about is the seeds of a murmuring spirit. That you're saying, oh, when is it enough? When have I done enough for God? i got to get busy about my life. When is it I've done enough to satisfy living for God so that I can get back to living for the world? That is a very dangerous mentality. That is a very scary place because he's either our master or he's not. You see, we're born into slavery. Whether you like it or not, you're a slave. You're either a slave to the world's de desires and expectations, or you're a slave to God's desires and expectations. You can't be both. God says you can't serve money and God. You can't love the world and God. In fact, it says if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And if you're going around with the attitude, well, oh, will I miss out on heaven if I don't do that? Will God send me to hell if I don't do that? Oh, do I have to go to church all the time? Am I going to go to hell for that? Let me tell you this. If that's your attitude, I fear for your soul. Because that kind of attitude says, I want the salvation part of God, but I don't want the service part of God. I want all the candy and none of the work. I want all of the benefits without the sacrifice. You see, that kind of grace doesn't exist. That's known as cheap salvation. And I'm so against it because I used to be for it. See, back in my ignorance, before I read the word, I believed a lot of things. I hadn't read the word. You see, the, the, the attitude that we must have must always remain in gratefulness. We need to constantly remind ourselves what God did for us, what God is doing for us, and what God wants to do for us in the future if we'll let him. You see, so many of us are trying to do just enough of God to appease our own guilt so we can get busy, get busy back in the world. But what God is trying to scream at you and tell you in scripture and in prayer and in worship and at church is that if all you do, but if you seek ye first the kingdom of God, all of these things will be added unto you. What does that mean? That means you put in pen the times that God has blessed us that we can fellowship and meet. You see, God has blessed us, church. We now have Sunday service. We have Tuesday night Bible studies, two of them. We have Wednesday night Bible study. We have Thursday night prayer. God has given us four opportunities each week to grow with him through fellowship of like-minded saints. But you know what the enemy wants to do? Oh, Sunday's good enough. Sunday, Wednesday night, that's good enough. Right, isn't that enough? Oh, or, or some, well, family night's Wednesday night. Sorry, we can't make it Wednesday night. Thursday night's family night. Oh, you know, I, I, I love going bowling on Wednesday night. It, it's enough I go to church. You see, the attitude is limiting God. And when you limit God, that's tempting God. Because when you limit God, you're saying, God, I know you want more for me, but I've got enough. You know what happens? <sighs> Why every desire of your heart draws the spirit of it. If you want a good enough God, you're going to get a good enough God. You will limit the anointing, the blessings, the healings, the miracles. You know, we pray for the blood of Jesus to cover our lives, but we don't want to do the sacrifice required for it. And you know what you're really saying when you say, Lord, I plead the blood over my finances. You're saying, God, I want your favor. I want your spirit to anoint it. I want it to be for you, but will you let it? You see, my point in this message and this is only the first half. They're doing pretty good. Praise God. Is that, is he our master or not? You see, if he's our master, then we do what he says. We're not worried about pleasing ourselves. We're worried about pleasing him. See, if, you're a, if, if you have a master, you obey. And he richly rewards. In fact, I've seen people so much already make the hard decision to get rid of the obstacles in their life. Get rid of the mountains, the molehills, everything that's stopping them from receiving the greatest anointing, the greatest purpose they can have in God. I've already seen examples of it, and it's amazing. 
Because some people will use obstacles in the flesh to say, well, this is the reason I can't make it. This is the reason why I can't read my Bible more. This is the reason I can't pray every day. And they will use all these reasons. But let me ask you this. Would God ever let you grow in the flesh to sacrifice in the spirit? Does that make sense? Will he ever say, I got some cross eyes there, so I, that went over some of your heads. And I probably said it wrong. Would God ever say, I'd rather you save money than grow with God? I'd rather you not go, to God, not go to church, but instead stay home in fellowship with your family. Why? Because the, what's more important to your family? Staying home, fellowship with them, or going to church and watching, having, you set an example that you're putting God first. You're putting his family first. Because we are your family. And you're putting God first. It is more convenient to not come. But it's more spiritual pleasing God to come because the sacrifice is always worth it the anointing the fervent absolute anointing of God and I know you hear me talking about some of you have no idea what I'm talking about I'm talking about you just walking to your car and God gives you a revelation in your life that can help you and you feel the spirit come all over you and you just smile and go wow thank you God that was amazing and then you're able to later use that to help someone else. That only comes when you have an attitude of gratitude and you want to live for God for everything he has for you. I'm so far off my notes. I'm just going to turn the page. All right. <laughs> I had a total different message plan. I don't know why God keeps doing this to me. Praise God. You see, there's a couple things that are the most common reasons why. We limit God. You see, there's an enemy in us. There always has been. And God wants to get it out. You see, the enemy that's in us that we're always trying to balance is we have things we care about. We have our mortgage. We have our nice cars. We have the, 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 the kids' baseball game. We have meeting at the mall for Sundays, you know, for ice cream on Saturdays. You know, we have different things we like to do. And so what happens is as God begins to move in our lives and we start seeking after him, God starts giving you more and more opportunities to grow with him like he has this church, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But unfortunately, our own flesh, our own desires say, well, I'll do Thursday and Sunday. I'll do Wednesday and Tuesday. And we'll pick instead of saying, thank you, Jesus, for so many opportunities to simply meet with the like-minded saints. You see, there's some people in this church that have not had such a great fellowship as we have. They don't take it for granted. They love it. They appreciate it. And we must realize it is an absolute blessing to be able to come here and grow together in God and that we need to take out the pen and mark, thank you, Jesus, for Sunday, for Tuesday, for Wednesday, for Thursday. Why? Because it'll help us receive all that God has for us. Do you know what God has for you is better than what you want for you? I've said that so many times. I don't think I can say it enough. What God wants for you is better than what you want for you. Do you know God is here right now and he's with you if you're a child of his all the time. And he's waiting to crush the enemies that are holding you back. The reason I say enemies is because normally it's, more, no, normally it's more than one temptation. Normally it's more than one care of the world. Normally it's several things. But let's cover one right now, time. So many people say, I just don't have the time. Now I understand that. Last summer I could do Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday. That's all I could do because I farmed. I couldn't do anything on Saturday, and I was just loaded with stuff. But you know what? I pinned Sunday for church. I pinned Tuesday night for Bibles. I pinned Wednesday night. And no matter what happened on the farm, I was here. You know why? Because I knew no matter what came at me during the week, if I made it a point to get to church, God would bless it. No matter what happened, you know why? Because I'm not living for myself. I'm living for God. And if it hurts my money, so be it. I don't care because I'm not going to let it hurt my spirit. But you see, there's other people in this church that have done the same thing. They've had time restrictions, and they make time. They drive great distances, and they do whatever they can to serve God, and God has blessed them. 
God is looking to bless every single person in here. But the enemy is holding him back. The enemy is holding him back. You say, what is that enemy? I'll get to it in a little bit. <laughs> you see, we got to schedule God's growth first and everything else second. We have to make it a point to do all we can to grow in God. Is there anything else more important? I mean, let's just get real. Is there anything more important than growing with God? Because when you're standing before Jesus, it's not going to matter if you got your mortgage paid off. It's not going to matter how many new cars you drove. It's not going to matter if you work two jobs or three jobs. The pay bills, all that's going to matter is were you saved and did you serve God? That's all that's going to matter. And I love what Brother Lee Stone King said. He said, when I get there and I fall on my face before Jesus, all I want to hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. But you know what he said that really struck me? He said, but I know what I will say. He said, I will say, I wish I had done more. I wish I had done more. And that struck me. That struck me so much. You know, time, we schedule things. We are masters of our schedules. We have, to, we have all the time to do whatever we want. Do you know you have 168 hours in a week? 168. If you add the services of Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday together, do you know that's only eight hours? Eight hours out of 168. We will work 40 hours a week for gold, but will you even do eight hours for God? I mean, think about that. Think about it. That's less than 5%. God in this church has allowed us the opportunity to fellowship and grow together with only 5% of our weekly time. And we think it's too much. Because the enemy, the number one enemy that plagues all of us is it's enough. It's enough. And that is the spirit of apathy. It hits us all. It's enough. Well, you know, I hate the spirit of apathy because the spirit of apathy limits God's blessings in your life. The spirit of apathy limits your ability to win souls for God. That spirit of apathy can keep you from seeing or praying through a family member to the Holy Ghost because you're not right with God. You see, we have to have an attitude of whatever I can do. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Yes, sister, and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So time, I've heard some people give, give, give things, well, I, I just don't have the time to do this. And I just had a vision. If Jesus was standing right there, and they gave that excuse, and then they turned and looked at Jesus. What would be the look on their face? <laughs> like, that wasn't a very good excuse after all. <laughs> because we all control our time. Now, I understand this. We all may be in positions right now with jobs and things that do limit us, and I understand that. Where I was last year, I was not able to do street evangelism like I wanted to. I wasn't able to do certain things, but I just prayed. I said, God, I'm working the job you gave me. I'm living where you put me. So, Lord, I want to do more, but, Lord, your will, not mine. Open the door where you can. Well, this year, I'm not farming at all. This year, God has set us free from that labor. We can do Saturdays. We can do so much more now. And God has just absolutely shown us he is the provider. He will stomp out and destroy every one of your enemies that you will willingly offer to him. You see, the problem with the enemy is that the initial temptation always feels good. Because that initial spirit of apathy attack, when it comes, it gives you peace. You know, you know I went there Sunday. I, I, I don't need to go tonight. Oh. And it just relieves you. But then what you don't know is that later on, when you're seeking a greater walk with God, 
and you wish you had more understanding in the word or you wish you were stronger in the spirit. You wish God would use you for healing or you wish God would use you to deliver an evil spirit or you wish God would use you, period. It's not there because you didn't take the first steps to grow with God. You see, no one becomes a servant of God automatically. First comes surrender to his will. Then God molds and changes them, and then he sets them free to go serve him. It is a process. You might say, well, what do I care about that? I'm not looking to serve. Think about your own life. Do you want God's blessing? Do you want his favor? Do you realize what he can do? There are people in this church who sacrificed money who absolutely made a sacrifice to come Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they did it faithfully because they decided, it's not my money, it's God's money. It's not my time, it's God's time. He bought me with the price, I belong to him. As long as I control it, I'll fear losing it. But as long as he controls it, I'm just his servant. I'm going to be set free in Jesus' name, and I'm not going to worry about these stresses, these pressures, and God's going to have to provide. If I'm going to go to church, it's going to hurt my finances. God's going to have to provide because for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. And you know, it didn't even take six weeks, and they were blessed. They got blessed with a vehicle that gets double the gas mileage. They got blessed mightily. And it's not just them. I've seen people who were given an opportunity. They had no money. They had no work. They were struggling to pay bills. There's creditors knocking, shut off notices coming. There was all kinds of things coming at them. And they get offered a job making $150,000 a year. Remember, the initials always looks good, right? The difference is they'll be gone from their family four days a week. Gone from their family four days a week. That would be tough with a family with kids, you know, living for God. That would be very, very tough. But you know what? Turned it down. They said, no, that's not a God because God would never make me sacrifice my relationship with him and my relationship leading my family with him for money. They said, there's no way. And now God is using them mightier than they've ever been used. God will test your heart. He will see where you're at. In fact, God is constantly revealing what's in your heart. He will show you time and time again. And until you learn to overcome those temptations, like I say, I say this like it's your problem. I say, the, by the time we all learn to overcome the temptations that come and we rise above it and say, no more, no more. I'm not doing that. I'm following what God wants me to do. When that moment happens, we go to a next level. We go to a next place and we have more freedom and more peace. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that what drives people to Jesus? Isn't that what, being set free from the enemy? Oh, God, let all thy enemies perish. Oh, God, let all thy enemies perish. You see, hmm, it is so amazing the power of temptation the enemy has over us. But did you know you can only be tempted with what you already desire? There are certain things that I'm not tempted at all in because I have no desire. But when you realize that the only power of the enemy that they have on you is your own heart's desire, then you realize that you actually control it. You can control the enemy in your life. You can control the enemy by what you allow in your heart. You can control the enemy by what you let your heart desire. You say, well, I can't. The Bible says you can't control your heart. You're right, but God can. Oh, God can. And don't you think God wants to tame that heart? Don't you think God wants to put his desires in your heart? Don't you think God wants to take you up off of the cares of this world and put you in his hands and deliver you into his peace and his joy, work in his will? Oh, you bet. That's the God I serve. That's the God I love. Because God is for me. He's not, and any weapon that's formed against me can't prosper as long as I'm in his arms. As long as I'm serving his will. You see, when I'm serving my own will, all bets are off. Because now I'm not in his protection. 
You see Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good, for them who love God and are called according to his purpose. But what does it mean to love God? John 14, 21 talks about that. Those who have his commandments and keep them, he it is that loveth me. So if you're not keeping his commandments, so you've got to read the Bible to know his commandments, and then you've got to keep them because it's not the hearers of the word, it's the doers of the word. And so, but here's the, here's the great part. It doesn't matter where you've been or where you're starting. If you're starting up here or starting down there, the moment you decide to turn your life the direction that God has for you, when you submit your will, when you start saying, it's not my money, it's your money. It's not my house, it's your house. It's not my job, it's your job. You know, some of us are holding on and fighting on to things that God's trying to get rid of. There are some people in here, I feel it right now, that have jobs that are hindering their lives, that are hurting their marriages, that are hurting their health. And God right now is wanting to give them something better. But because they're not releasing it to God, because they're not doing it for God, because they haven't surrendered it to God, God can't bless them. And God can't bless any of us who won't surrender to him. You want to bless your finances? Give it to them. You want to bless your marriage? Give it to them. You want to bless your kids? You give it to them. Those aren't my kids. Those are his kids. I know Brother Paul. Those aren't his kids. Those are God's kids. Because God's a lot better father than I can be. God's a lot better father. I just do what he wants me to do, and I try to do it as best as I can. And when I mess up, I get on my knees and I pray for forgiveness because we all fall short. But you know what? Our hearts can be for God. Is it good enough? Is where you're walking with God right now, is it good enough? Do you want more? I hear the stories from Pastor Billingsley of people falling out of their chairs and crawling to the altar in repentance. I hear the stories from Brother Paul of Blue Haze and of people running to the altar, weeping before the preaching's even done. I've heard stories of so much conviction and people rejecting the word of God that they fall out on the aisle on their bellies and they slither out like snakes. Now you want to see the miraculous. You want to see God's power. You want to build your faith to get it to a level that you release God's power in your life. We must first have revival in ourselves. We must purge ourselves from these desires of the world and let God take control of our future, of our destiny, of what we want, of how we work, of where we spend our time, of where we spend our money. We must continually seek after God's heart and he will show up mightily. We will see angels. We will see the crippled heal. We will see the lame walk. We will see the deaf hear. We will see the blind see. We will see God in action. He's waiting on us. But we're comfortable. I know. I don't know who just said that, but I just heard it. It was you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just heard that. But we're comfortable. That's right. That's why Egypt, Sudan, Philippines, they see miraculous things. China, Russia. See the dead raised because they're not comfortable. See, although our flesh is protected, our spirit is suffering because our flesh is so protected. You see, when God took Israel out, he purposely ran them through some trials because although he separated their bodies from the enemy, their hearts were still for the comfort of Egypt. God separates us in baptism in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Spirit with evidence of tongues. He separates us. But you know what he has to work out of us? Every one of us. Our heart's desire for the comforts of the flesh. So how does he do it? He brings trials. He brings tribulations. He tests your heart. And when finances get tough, do you stop tithing? Whose money is it? When finances get tough, do you take a job to work on Sundays? Don't have time for God? Whose time is it? Whose life do you belong to? God's looking 
to give testimonies. He's looking to show his glory. He's looking for the person who says, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I don't care what happens. If God gives me a new job, if he gives me a new house, gives me a new car, if he changes everything about my life, if I go from making 150000 down to 30000 I don't care. As long as I'm serving him, as long as I feel his peace, as long as I got the joy of the Lord in my step, that's all that matters because I will love God and I will receive whatever he deems is best for me, not what I deem. Is, this, is, is the picture getting clearer now? Praise God. Praise God. You see, I bring that up because in Noah's time, in Noah's time, mankind had upset the Lord so much that he repented, he even made him. In Noah's days, men had become so evil that they were constantly thinking on evil. I mean, in Noah's days, God, who repented, decided to destroy all the earth, all the animals, all the trees on land, except for that which was in the ark. Do you know Noah's dad didn't even get saved? Noah's dad was alive and killed in the flood. He died at 777 years old. 777 years old, Noah's dad did. But you know what's interesting about that story? We all know it's a story, a story of wrath and judgment, but did you know that God says in his word that he will never again destroy the world like that for whose sake? For man's sake. He destroyed all the wicked people. He destroyed all those people. For whose sake? For man's sake. If you want to see more of that, look at Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 through 21. He destroyed them for man's sake. Why? Because they became the enemy of God. And those who do not worship God in truth, those who do not chase after him, those who are compelled to live in the world and the lust thereof, those people who hate Christians, who hate the things that we're about, they are the enemy of God. They are the enemy. But what was it they had? Specifically, in Genesis 6, 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Notice he didn't say anything about their actions. Notice they didn't say anything about their building projects or their local government. He went right to the center of the matter. The imagination of the thoughts of his heart. Don't tell me, oh, all I did was think it. I didn't do it, so it's okay. Don't tell me, I'll just entertain these thoughts, but I won't do anything. For the word says, as, a, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. He, and I want to tell you, I got to fear the Lord in me that my heart would ever betray me because if anything is going to send me away from God, it's going to be my own heart's desires because the enemy can do nothing to a child of God. We've been baptized in Jesus' name, so we now have authority and that we have no sin. We are freed from them, and then we receive the spirit, but the evidence of tongues, so we have the power of Jesus' name. So we have power. We have authority and we have power. They can do nothing to us that we don't let them do. You see, every sin, every desire, every heart's desire of this world, you know, to live in the nicest house. You say, well, what's wrong with living in a nice house? Here's the thing. Being a former home builder, you can have the nicest house you want, but is it a financial burden on your family? I built homes for people, and they had $8,000 mortgage payments a month. And I saw them stress and struggle making that payment. I also built houses for people who paid cash. There was a different attitude with those people. You know, they weren't as stressed out. They weren't as worrisome. They had a lot more peace about them. You see, what I found is that you can have a really nice house that doesn't hurt your budget. You can drive a car that will do all the work it needs to do without breaking the bank. You can do so much 
was so little. God just taught me that in the last couple years. My monthly budget used to be 9000 a month. That's what I needed to break even when we were out in Colorado. He took us from that to learning how to live off of $500 a month. $500 a month. That was hard. And I don't wish that on any of you. But let me ask you, why did God break us like that? Because the desire, the handle that we had in our heart for those nice things was so strong that he had to strip us of all of that worldliness, all those cares. He had to get rid of that out of us so that we could serve him better. So he broke us down. You see, God doesn't pick the torment we will face. Our hearts do. God wants to take us to the next level, and he looks at our heart. And he says, ah, you're going to have to go through some stuff to get that out of there. You're going to have to face some trials to get that out of there. You see, if we don't pray and give it to God, he's going to let the tormentors come and show it to us. And he's going to keep showing it to us. And keep showing. You can cast out tormentors in the name of Jesus. You can say, devils be gone in the name of Jesus, and they'll go. But the second that heart starts entertaining that thought, they're right back again. I know I'm not making this up. I've seen this. I've seen it with people in this church. I've seen it with people outside this church. You pray, it's gone, and then it comes back. Like, what's, what's, what's going on? And say, well, they didn't have the Holy Ghost. Yeah, they did. You see, the Holy Ghost is to guide us. But if you can resist the will of the world, you can resist the will of God. And we must always know the difference. Because to whom you serve, you obey. Whether sin unto death or righteousness into everlasting life. So, this message tonight, we must allow God, let all thy enemies perish, O Lord. And it's so nice to think about all the enemies of God out there. All the enemies of God. But you know, the enemies, the true enemies of God, are those that are holding back his church. The enemy of God are those that are limiting his power. The enemies of God are those and those things that limit him and his revival and his evangelism and soul winning. So yes, there are some desires in my heart that are the enemy of God. And I pray, oh God, let all thy enemies in me perish help me jesus and we need as a congregation to say that we need to give god authority and directive to absolutely come into our hearts because he won't touch your free will that's part of the business of us being his children he will not touch our free will but if we freely give it oh he takes that clay up on the potter's wheel, throws some Holy Ghost water, and starts to form you, starts to mold you, starts making you into something. And yeah, it might hurt. It might be uncomfortable. But just realize what God has for you is better than what you ever wanted for yourself. I used to want to make $10,000 a month, residual income from real estate or from whatever, so I could play on the beaches. And I remember thinking, oh, God, don't worry. I'll kick you down $1,000. I'll pay off the, my guilt. I remember thinking that. Now, I could care less about the beaches. You know why? Because they're all going to burn. Amen. When I'm standing before Jesus, which is going to happen, see, many of us, we don't take life serious because we don't remember the end. This is not the end. The end of this life starts at the feet of Jesus. When you're looking at him and he's looking at you and he's saying, what'd you do? Did you live for me? Or did you live... For your flesh. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. God destroyed the whole planet. All of the men, women, children, animals. Do you guys realize they imagined that they, they killed millions upon millions of people and saved eight? Don't tell me. God is into gray area. Don't tell me God is into the good enough business. Don't tell me God is going to let some sin slide. Don't tell me God is going to overlook some things. Now, I realize there's power in addiction, but what I'm talking about is not 
that if you are on drugs or drinking or smoking or into pornography or into something else, it's are you trying to get out of it? Are you fighting the desire? Are you praying on your knees saying, God, I hate it. I don't want it. Lord, let all thy enemies perish. God, help us. In Jesus' name, help us, Lord. Because that's the heart. That's the desire. That's what God wants in all of us. He just says, let me in and I will kick them out. He will put a whooping on every desire that's holding you back in God. He will absolutely put a stump, a foot on the neck of every addiction, every desire, everything that's keeping you from being having the greatest life you can possibly have serving him. But it all starts right here. You ready? Who are you going to serve? Who will you allow to be your master? Who will you allow to tell you what to do? You gonna let TV commercials tell you to buy that nice new car? You gonna let TV commercials tell you where to live? You gonna let billboards tell you? Because God will tell you. Quick story, I kept thinking we need another freezer. We need freezers for our business because we have a lot of frozen meat. And the freezers we kept seeing were 1,000, 1,500. I'm like, man, that's a lot of money. You know, God has blessed us, and I'm like, well, we could put that, we, we could spend it, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm not feeling it. You see, I've had brothers help me in the word and show me that the purpose of the Holy Ghost is not just to feel good. The purpose of the Holy Ghost is not just to confirm that he's there for you, but the purpose of the Holy Ghost is help you live for him. And so when it's not your money, it's God's money, when you're going to spend $1,000, I suggest you ask him. And I didn't get any peace. I got nothing. But you know what? One day, a brother in the church called me up and said, hey, there's this brand new freezer at this garage sale. I said, really? He goes, yeah, it's like over six feet tall and looks brand new. I said, how much? He said, 150 bucks. I said, sold. Because when he said 150 bucks, the Holy Spirit went, yes, all over me. And I was thinking, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Because it's his money. It's not my money. It's his money. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about going broke. Been there, done that. I don't have to worry about being on food stamps. Been there, done that. I don't have to worry about working 80, 90 hours a week, making 75 cents or 2 bucks an hour. Been there, done that. I passed. I live. I'm preaching the word, living for God. And I remember thinking, God, if that's, what the, if that's the best you have for me right now, praise God. Whatever you want. Do you know the first year that we came out here, I think it was like our 12th or 13th year of marriage, was our best year of marriage up until that point? How many people can go, through, go from making 250 grand a year three years later to making nine, living in a barn, two-bedroom apartment, farming, with a master's education and have the best year of your marriage. That's God. That wasn't the enemy putting me down. That was God pruning out of my heart the desires for financial success. That was God pruning out of my heart my belief that I'm somebody because I can make a living. That was God pruning out of my heart my self-reliance because I wouldn't take charity from anybody. I was always the one giving and not receiving. Oh, you couldn't give me nothing. Uh-uh, you can't give me nothing. I had to learn to receive. I had to learn to humbly say, okay, you can, you can take my family out to eat. I had to humbly learn that. And so I'm telling you, whatever we don't give God, if you keep praying and keep seeking God, saying, God, take me to the next level, if you don't give him authority to change your heart and help you, he's going to let the enemy do it. Just ask Job. And I'm going to close with this, sister, if you want to come up. I bring up Job. Did you guys ever catch in Job? Have you really studied Job? He was very wealthy. Wife, 10 kids, all kinds of cattle, very wealthy. But he sacrificed animals every day because he feared his sons might have sinned. And it says in the scripture, he says, my greatest fears have come upon me. Now think about this. He was a mighty man of God. He was righteous, but he 
had fears. So what happened? God let the enemy in and cured his fear. Did you ever think about that? At the end, when God came back and restored Job to twice, do you think he ever feared losing anything again? Because God just took it all, and then God gave it back. So Job, from that moment on, would never have to worry about finances. He's like, it's God's. He gave it to me. He'll take it. I'm just going to praise him anyways. You see, the spirit of fear is the other spirit that hinders this church and hinders myself and hinders his saints because it limits our faith. It limits how much we expect God to move. We brought people down here, and I start praying on them, and I'm new with this. I don't know anything else except they're going to walk. They're going to get healed. I haven't, seen that many, I haven't seen very many examples of people not getting healed. I've seen a lot of examples of people getting healed. And as I'm praying for them, I start feeling all this doubt. I start, I'm like, what is going on in here? It's the spirit of fear. It's the spirit of expectation. We need to cast out the spirit of expectation that is limited by our own minds thinking and realize that God's expectation is for his glory to show. God's expectation is for his testimony to reign. God's expectation is for us to do cartwheels down this aisle, filled with the Holy Ghost, running into each other, not being hurt, and having the glory cloud fill this place with such a degree that people are swarming here from outside the state because they just want a little taste of what it's like to be in the presence of God that is what God wants you know why because it gives him glory it gives him glory well praise God if you would stand with me and I'll just say that the altar is open if you feel led to come come but I'm going to end with this God has laid it on my heart that we must allow him to perish all his enemies in us. We need to realize the only thing that's stopping us from having the massive revival and evangelism spirit outbreak with souls being saved is us. If we start praying more, if we start reading the word more, if we start seeking after his heart, if we start saying, you know what? These things in the flesh aren't as important as growing with God. And we start taking the pen out and start scheduling in the things of God. The blessed opportunities we have to fellowship in his spirit. The blessed opportunities we have to come together and pray. If you've been to those prayer meetings Thursday night, you know what I'm talking about. That was the first time in my life I ever felt lightning in my bones. Now, I'm describing it exactly how I felt it because I felt the Holy Spirit. I have been laid out in this prayer. I have felt anointing. But when I prayed on Sister Landis and when I prayed on Sister Goldie and I prayed on Sister Raquel, I started, this, this, this lightning started building up in me, and I just, I just couldn't help it. I just, my legs started moving, and I just had to take off running. And I ran around the church, and I know some of you think, well, what's the big deal? I hate running in church because I hate attention. I'm the guy who doesn't want to be noticed. I know you can't imagine that, but ask my wife. I'm the guy who doesn't want to be noticed. The only reason I'm able to do this and, and, and praise up here is because I decide I care what he thinks more than I care what you think. I care more about what God thinks than what anyone else thinks. And did you know that as I hit that aisle and turned, the spirit didn't go down any. It kept building up. And for hours after that prayer meeting, I still felt that lightning in my bones. I felt electricity. I felt at peace. I just sat right here in the front pew, just sat there with my hands open. And it was just the most surreal feeling I'd ever felt. And all we did was pray. All we did is pray. Oh, Lord, let all thy enemies perish. Oh, Lord. We need to pray. We need to seek him. We need to come. In the name of Jesus, if God is calling on your heart, if you've got things in your heart that you know you need God to get rid of, why don't you come forward and seek him at the altar he's provided us at this church. If you've got things in your heart that you know that God needs to rip out that's hindering you, that's stopping you, then why don't you come down and pray? Because I'm going to pray right here too. We need to come and release and have God rebuke all of the handles of the enemy that are slowing us down. We need God to destroy, to perish the enemies in us. We need God to set us free from our own 
selfish desires. Oh, Jesus, let all thy enemies perish. Oh, God, Jesus' name. Wash me white as snow, purify this heart of mine, Lord, I'm giving you control. Let me be a vessel, one that's worthy to be used. Make me in your image, make me more like you. Make me in your image. Wash me white as snow, purify this heart of mine, Lord, I'm giving you control, let me be a vessel, Praise God. Praise one that's worthy to be Praise used, make Praise me God. in your image, make you know. me more that besides the spirit of apathy that grips us, there's a spirit of pride that can absolutely tell us things are okay. You're great. That's the ugly cousin of the spirit of apathy. And I want everyone here to know that the spirit of pride can absolutely hinder your walk and growth with God. Absolutely hinder. In fact, the Lord said he resists the prideful. We must realize that no matter where we are in life, we are still nothing. For everything we are comes from God. Everything that is good about us comes from him. Everything. And if you think, oh, the spirit of pride will lie. Oh, if you go down front, they're going to think you're a sinner. If you go down front... They're going to think you're not already living for God. Well, you know what we see? When we see people come down front, we see people who say, more of you and less of me. 
We see people who say, I want more of God in my life. We see people who say, I want more blessing, I want more anointing, and I want more favor in my life. So you tell that spirit of pride to go. For what God has for you is better than what you can ever want for yourself. Praise God. If you've received all that you've wanted from God here today, you're dismissed in Jesus' name. But if you want more, we will continue to stay and pray for you and help you in every way possible that God will allow us to pray for you, to anoint you. If you have needs, we have prayer, and God has answers. If you want anointing, we've got oil. You want pray for fa your prayer for favor? You want prayer for strength? You want prayer for healing? You want prayer for miracles? The altar is open. And we would love to pray and ask God to bless you. In Jesus' name. Make me in your image. Wash me white as snow. Purify this heart of mine. Lord, I'm giving you control. Let me be a vessel, one that's worthy to be used. Make me in your image. 